To the bridge we're glad you joined us we offer many other fellowship opportunities throughout the week we would love to have you attend one or several on sunday mornings at 9 15 a.m is our adult sunday school bible study at the church currently joe dankel is teaching through the gospel of matthew on thursday mornings at 8 30 a.m our local podcast digging deeper is dropped you can find the podcast on Facebook, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform by searching Digging Deeper with Mandy and Erica. On Saturday mornings at 9:10 a.m., Pastor Aaron hosts Refuge Radio, a radio broadcast ministry that seeks to love people under the shelter of truth. The broadcast is available on WMBS 101.1 FM or 590 a.m or you can watch live on the WMBS and Bridge Facebook pages. Currently, he is studying through Philippians. On the last Sunday of every month at 9.15 a.m. before morning worship is our prayer service and Bible study. Please come out and join us so we can pray together as a church. We are proud to be hosting our third annual Back to School Bash on August 12, 2023 from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Masontown German Park. Make sure to spread the word as there will be opportunities for free school supplies, free haircuts, activities for kids, vendors, food trucks, and more. And don't forget a swimsuit for this year's special water slide. 
To volunteer or to make a Chinese auction basket, please see Courtney Gibson. We are planning a volunteers meeting on August 9th at the church. We'd love to have you if you're interested. Now, let's join Pastor Aaron as he continues his sermon series in 1 Kings. All right, church, let's open up our Bibles this morning to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And uh, this is going to be our uh, last sermon for a while in 1 Kings. We're going to be pausing on 1 Kings after uh, today. We're going to really, this is where we come to the end of Solomon's reign, the end of his life. And that's a good place, I think, for us to pause. We did this with the life of David. We did this with First and Second Samuel. We tried to uh, pause at certain places that are good places to kind of take a break and do some other things and then return. These are big studies. These are big books of the Bible. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover chapter 11 today. We're going to come to the end of King Solomon's life and reign. And then uh, I'm going to be out for the next couple of weeks. But I'm telling you, there's some really cool things that are planned for you guys while I'm out. Tim Florian from the Christian Fellowship of Christian Athletes is going to be here next week. He's going to be preaching to you. He's going to give you an update on the ministry. Uh, some really good things that you don't want to miss. Wonderful things that's happening in the high schools, and it's great to be a part of that, support that. So he'll be here with you guys. Come out and support him, hear from him next week. And then the following week, my brother, uh, Pastor David Douthit from New Life Baptist Church in Dunbar is going to be preaching for us. You don't want to miss Pastor David as he comes and preaches to you. Uh, I'm sure he'll have many jokes for you at my expense, but uh, <laughs> uh, come and hear my brother preach. You don't want to miss that. And then the following Sunday, the last Sunday of the month, we're going to have some really good testimonies that are just going to kind of fire you guys up about reigniting maybe that passion in your heart on who we are as a church and moving forward, really planning ahead and, and setting that vision before you. Have some great things prepared for you that Sunday. So you don't want to miss that uh, as we continue to plow forward forward as a body. And then when I come back in September, we're going to be diving right into Ecclesiastes in a study that I'm going to call Solomon's Journal. Uh, we're going to look at his journal that he writes, and it's a great place to do that. We'll be able to break from 1 Kings. We've come to the end of his life here now, and then we're going to look back, and we're going to see where his life led uh, when he got out of center with where he needs to be with the Lord. And we're going to look through uh, Ecclesiastes, and guys, I encourage you, invite uh, people who are unchurched to that study. It's going to be a very good practical uh, uh, study not only for us as believers, but for the unchurched and for unbelievers. When they hear those messages preached, uh, they're going to really see that life really is vain and empty apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so make sure you invite people to that. Uh, and then with that said, let's go ahead and dive right into it. I don't want to talk any longer prolong, although if that sign-up sheet, like I said, I'll keep preaching this morning. First Kings chapter 11, we'll see how this goes. Let's stand. First Kings 11 and start with verse 1. It says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Uh-oh. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Moabite, Ammonite, uh, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them. Neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Verse 4, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, or the, uh, the, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. 
Then Solomon built high, a high place for Kamosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the uh, Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord and the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. And the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the royal house of Edom. For when David was in Edom and Joab the commander of the army went up to bury the slain, he struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel remained there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom. But Hadad fled to Egypt together with certain Edomites of his father's servants, Hadad still being a little child. They set out from Midian and came to Paran and took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house and assigned him an allowance of food and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him in marriage the sister of his own wife, the sister of uh, Tepens, uh, the, uh, the queen. And the sister of Tepens bore him Genubath, his son, whom Tepens weaned in uh, Pharaoh's house. And Genubath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. But when Hadad heard in Egypt that uh, David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I may go to my own country. But Pharaoh said to him, what have you lacked with me that you are not now seeking to go to your own country? And he said to him, only let me depart. God also raised up as an adversary, so here's another one, to him, Razan, the son of uh, Eliada, who had fled from his master Hadadezer, king of Zobath. And he gathered men about him and became leader of a marauding band after the killing by David. And they went to Damascus and lived there and made him king in Damascus. He was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, doing harm as Hadad did. And he, he loathed Israel and reigned over Syria. Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, an Ephra Ephraimite of Zerida, a servant of Solomon whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow also lifted up his hand, uh, a widow, also lifted up his hand against the king, and, he, and this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. And at the, that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the Shelonite, uh, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had dressed him in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes. But he, also, uh, but, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. 
Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Kamosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it to you ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. And I will take you, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways, and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments, as David my father did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house, as I built for David." And I will give Israel to you, and I will afflict the offspring of David uh, because of this, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt to uh, Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the books of the acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this text. Lord, I pray, Lord, as we look at this final chapter for now in 1 Kings, Lord, of Solomon's life. Lord, may we see you. May we be drawn to your heart and what you have for us in this chapter of your word, God. May you speak to us by your spirit. Lord, may the people not even hear me or see me, Lord, but may they simply hear you and see you, Jesus. May you be exalted. May you be high and lifted up. And may you draw us before your presence, Lord, and teach us now by your spirit. And Lord, help us to walk away from our time together more like you, Jesus and edified and built up in the faith and challenged. May sinners be saved. May saints be edified. May the Father be glorified. May you be exalted, Lord Jesus. May your word go forth clearly and concisely and in power. And Lord, may you give me the words in your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So I wonder if you could finish this line for me. Humpty Dumpty... Humpty Dumpty, all the king's horses and all the king's men. You guys are on it. See, we're going to go real deep this morning, as you can see here. I was thinking about that old nursery rhyme as I read through this chapter, and I was meditating on it this week. And I was thinking about the, that, that rhyme, and for some reason it just kept coming back to my mind. Uh, maybe it's because I have uh, three kids and one on the way now, uh, and I'm used to those nursery rhymes, but I really was looking at Saul, or I'm looking at Solomon, and I'm thinking, he's kind of a Humpty Dumpty king, isn't he? Uh, at this point, he falls, he crashes, it can't be put back together, it's unsalvageable, it is a mess. And uh, interestingly enough, when you look at the origin, I was thinking about it so much that I looked up the origin of Humpty Dumpty, that old nursery rhyme. And a matter of fact, it's not, he's not an egg. We're never told that he's an egg. We assume he's an egg because of his frailty. And he's just fragile and he falls and uh, he's, they try to put him back together. But actually, many think that the origins behind that old uh, nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, is about King Richard, King Richard III. King Richard III of England, who is supposed to have been humpbacked, and who was defeated at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. And this means that Humpty Dumpty is, of course, then in the rhyme, representing the king. The wall is his reign and fight to preserve power. The fall is his defeat, and all the, horse, and all the king's horses and all the king's men is the army that failed to prevail as the king fell and the kingdom fell. 
And in any case, uh, to the rhyme, it, it reminds me again of Solomon. All the context clues that we've seen uh, point us to the fact that this is not going to end well for Solomon. Haven't we seen that? That here's a guy who just seems to have too much for one man, doesn't he? Here's a guy who seems to constantly ride the fence, and we've seen this with now to the point where it, just, it has escalated to this astronomical amount of women in his life and idolatry and worshiping false gods and all this money and all this power has obviously gone to this Humpty Dumpty King's head. And it crumbles and it falls and it comes crashing down. And many simply do not think of... uh, the reality of their fall, uh, as they're heading into the, the, the mess that they're getting themselves into, they don't think about the mess. It's going to be left behind when they're gone. They don't think about the ones who are going to be impacted by their foolish mistakes. They don't think about the ones like the king's horses and the king's men that come and have to put it, try to put this back together, and it's unsalvageable. We can't fix this. Uh, no leader thinks about that. They don't think about their consequences to their actions. Fathers don't think about that when they sin against their home. They don't think about that when they sin against their children. Mothers, the same, we could, we could go both ways here. Mothers don't think about the consequences of their actions. Children don't think about that. Pastors don't think about that. When you're in the muck of your sin, all you are thinking about is yourself. And before you know it, there's a crash, there's a fall, there's a mess, and there's consequences. There's always consequences to your actions. Nobody gets away with it. Nobody ever gets away. Even if they could go their whole entire life and they seem to just skyrocket and soar in so many ways. And you think, man, uh, look how that person soars for Jesus. But at the end of their life, how many stories have we heard? Here comes the scandal. No, this is what was going on and it blows up. And it's a mess. And the pain is inflicted on the ministry. The pain is inflicted on the family. The pain is inflicted on the children and the grandchildren from the mess that's left behind by people who didn't think about the consequences of their actions. You guys have heard me say that when it comes to ministry, when it comes to the church, no one is an island. Amen? We're not here in our, we can't, we can't get this, this, this self-centered mindset that life is somehow all about us, that we're the center of our own universe. Because what do we end up doing? We end up worshiping ourselves. And it creates a mess not only for us, but all those who are around us, especially those who are closest to us. Solomon in time, what's really happened here, what I've entitled our text for today is the divided heart. That's exactly what happened to Solomon, isn't it? His heart became divided. His affections are divided up. He's no longer singular in his passion and his love and his dedication to Jesus. His his affections and his love uh, that should have been directed towards the Lord his God who gave him everything he has has been divided up now. Let me tell you, when you've got a thousand women in your life, it's a lot of divisions, right? He's got a mess on his hands, not only the women, but the money and the fortune and the fame. Obviously, at this point, when you see the man uh, and what's become of him and the idolatry in his life, see, the big problem is is not just the women, but what the women are tied to uh, as well. Idolatry, worshiping all these false gods. But the writing was on the wall for quite some time. And here's, here's the, this man divided up in his affections, divided up with his heart. He's now going in the way of his carnal desires, the evil passions of his own flesh. At this point, we, we knew the fall was coming. We could see there were context clues that there, this was not going to end well for him. Realistically, at some point in our own lives, we know that when things begin to spit out of control in our own lives, that we could look into the mirror and we could see we're heading for a fall. Although typically what happens is we don't want to admit it to ourselves. Others have to tell us, right? That how it goes. You've got to confront somebody. You've got to talk to somebody. And you try to get them to that place of looking into the mirror. No, look what you have done. Well, Solomon's present love in verses 1 through 8, what we see here, his present love stood in contrast to his past love. Doesn't that just hit us right between the eyes, Right? I mean, you can't, that, you can't miss that in verses 1 through 8, that there's a contrast being drawn here. 
This is where you were, and this is where you are. And let me, let me say that, that where we're at now should not be the same place necessarily where we should be a year from now, in a good way, but not in a bad way. Amen? We should be growing. We should be advancing, not only as a church body, brothers and sisters, but as individuals of the body of Christ. We should always be growing. But there are some, if you were honest, I wonder if you could look into the mirror and say, you know what? I was far more, <coughs> excuse me, passionate about the Lord a year ago than I was today. If that's you, then it's time to wake up. Amen? Don't go any further in that direction. You could very well end up just like Solomon here. You could say that Solomon has left his first love at this point in his life. His first love. What is to be my first love? My first love, my top priority is Jesus Christ. Just as it's to be your first love. The moment he is not your first love is the moment you have some kind of other God in your life that is distracting you and tugging at your heart away from him. I think of, when I think of Solomon, my, uh, I, I started to think of um, what Jesus said to the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, 4 through 5. Listen to what Jesus had to say to this church. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. Amen? Repent. That means to turn around. Repent, turn from your sin, do the works you did at first. If not, Jesus says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You know what happens to churches that lose their first love? They lose their impact of light in this world for the glory of Christ. They lose their influence on their community. And it's not long before those doors are closed. And sealed shut. Kings lose their first love. Churches lose their first love. Christians can lose their first love. This doesn't mean that the king is no longer a king. This doesn't mean that the church is no longer a church. It doesn't mean that the believer is no longer a believer. However, your affections have become divided. Your heart has become torn and given to that which it shouldn't be given to. The Lord Jesus is no longer held in your heart and in your mind in his proper place as Lord where he belongs over your heart and over your life. Your heart's divided. You have strayed. You have wandered. You have spiritually drifted from your first love. You at one time were consecrated and faithful, but you have since waxed cold. You become carnal, worldly, callous towards necessary convictions that you once held to. Do you ever think about that? Man, how convicted I was, how sensitive I was to the Holy Spirit. What happened? Like Samson, you get up one day and it, he, he didn't even realize that the Spirit just wasn't there anymore. Something's changed. Something's changed. You've given your heart to Delilah. The fire has burnt out, so to speak. The waters have become stagnant. The fruit is no longer pleasant, but it's like gravel now in your mouth and you're biting down on gravel. This fruit you thought you told yourself you wanted to have and was good for you to have and now it's turned to gravel in your mouth. You're breaking your teeth on things you shouldn't have eaten of. You're a mess. And you've gone after that which is gross and immoral and against the king and his kingdom. David put it this way. David went through this. David said this in Psalm 51 in his great confession psalm. He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. That means a repentant heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God doesn't despise that. God takes you to that. And he delights in the repentance of his people. And it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to go through. It's not a pleasant thing to go through. But there are times w in which our father has to chasten us and discipline us and break us to bend us back to where we need to be. That's his mercy, by the way. That's his grace to do that. He, he calls us back like that prodigal. Come home, amen? Come home. 
You have a father. What are you doing out here with the pigs? What are you doing out here in the muck? Turn around, come back, and there's your father with his arms wide open, ready to embrace you and kiss you and love on you and celebrate you because he loves you. Why did you go out to the pigs? Turn around, come home. This happens to people more than you might realize. Happens to people all the time. Yes, it could happen to you. Don't think for one second that you're just okay and you're always going to be okay and I'm just following Jesus and nothing's getting in my way. Let me tell you, be careful. Be vigilant. Be steadfast. You know what I don't like in my life? I don't like when I find myself not being challenged. Because when I'm no longer being challenged, you know what happens to 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 me, your pastor? I'll get complacent. And if I get complacent, I can find myself getting a little bit of carnality that begins to consume me. And it can happen to you. It happens to people all the time. I think of the old hymn. Do you know this hymn? Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart. Take and seal it for thy courts above. Notice how King Solomon, he loved many foreign wives. You can underscore the word now in that verse, verse 11. Now, we're taken to the present tense of King Solomon's life. This tells us that something has shifted, something has changed now in comparison to where he was then. You see that? Something has shifted now. We're in the present tense of the king's life and it's standing in contrast to where he was back then, where he was in the past. Let's go to the now. And I was thinking about this and I I think it's interesting. I wonder if you guys would agree with this. But I find it interesting that many people are either overly concerned with where they have been or they're overly concerned with where they are going. But we often fail in being concerned with, wait a minute, where am I right now in the present? Many of us, we become obsessed with the past or we're obsessed with the future and our goals and our dreams and the things. Those are good to have, but you need to be concerned with where your heart is right now with the Lord your God. I think of what God told Moses, I am who I am. He is the God who is and he is now. And your heart should be concerned with that always, amen? It's, it's great to know where you came from. It's great to learn from your past. It's a great to appreciate your roots. It's equally as important to know where you're heading in the future, to know your goals, to know your life mission, to understand your purpose and your destination and, and what lies ahead of your life. But don't forget the vital importance of where your heart is right now with the Lord Jesus. You see, when I read the word now, as the author points out to us here, we're in the present life of Solomon as an older man. He's an older king at this point with a love that is wayward, a love that's gone in the wrong places. Remember where this all started. Just revisit the past for a moment with me with Solomon. Remember where we saw this with King Solomon. There was a time when Solomon loved the Lord. The Bible said that. He loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father, 1 Kings 3.3. There was a time, how many Christians have you heard say that? There was a time I drove bus. There was a time I knocked on doors. I put the Jehovah Witnesses to shame. There was a time I would get on my bike and pedal to tell people about Jesus if I had to. There was a time I taught Sunday school class. There was a time I would fill the pulpit for the pastor. There was a time I served as a deacon. There was a time I participated in baptism. There was a time I served alongside my church. Okay, but what are you doing now? Well, I'm just no longer involved. I'll tell you what happened. There was a shift at some point. You got lazy. You got complacent. You got carnal, and your heart went wayward. It's time to wake up. Amen? The, the, there, that, that was the beginning of Solomon's reign when he loved the Lord. He even walked in the statutes. He was compared to David. He was like David, his father. And the, the, this was the beginning of his reign when the Lord appeared to Solomon. God showed up in Solomon's life twice in two big, two big ways. And the first time was 1 Kings 3, 5 for the first time. That was also within that humble state of Solomon. You remember this? When he himself stated before the Lord that I am but a little child, 1 Kings 3, 7. I like that Solomon. Humble Solomon. 
I am but a little child. You know what happened to Solomon like many of us? You know what happened to him? When he was little, he was humble. But now he's an arrogant adult. Take a visit downstairs and talk to the kids a little bit about their love for Jesus. And they're unapologetic. I mean, my kids will share Jesus with people. They're always, do they know Jesus? Are they a Christian? Sometimes I'm like, wow, I need, I need that humility in my life. Amen? Something happens to us if we're not careful as we grow up as adults. We get hard-headed, we get thick, and we get proud in our arrogance and our pride. And this is Solomon, he's grown up now. He thinks he's, he thinks he's, big, he's big and he's bad and he's, he's got this great kingdom for himself. He can do whatever he wants. Uh, but there was a time when he was humble and he didn't have anything and he couldn't do anything and he stood there desperate for the Lord. I need you to do this. I can't do it. Sometimes it's really good. Matter of fact, it's always good to be at that place with God. That apart from him, you are but a little child who can not even stand on his own two feet. Amen? Some of us lose that desperation in our life, and it's called pride. It's called arrogance. And so when God told that little child that he could have anything he asked for, the child requested, would you give me an understanding mind? Why? To govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. Imagine that, 1 Kings 3, 9. There was a time that was Solomon. He was concerned with judging uh, good and evil, and that pleased the Lord, didn't it? Because this is, this is the purpose of the king, not for your own means, not to build your own kingdom or to build your own ego or to build yourself up in any way. This is not about you, but this is about Yahweh. So this was pleasing to the Lord that this is all Solomon asked for. I need an understanding mind to judge between good and evil. This was Solomon's heart. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and, I, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, now, uh, I, 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 be, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you all. Also, what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no king shall compare with you all your days. That was back in 1 Kings 3, 10 through 13. And God followed through with everything he promised to Solomon, didn't he? But this was never for Solomon's own ego. It was for the glory of God. Amen? God had answered his, that, that prayer for little Solomon. God was more than willing to bless Solomon. But as I've said the last two weeks now, God is willing to bless us. God is willing to bless our lives. But guess what? He's not willing to let you drag his name and your hypocrisy through the mud of your own selfishness. Amen? We don't get to, to, to put on some badge of Christianity, brothers. I'm preaching to myself just as I'm preaching to you in this. We don't get to wear some badge of Christianity and then go walk through the mud and drag the name of our Savior through that mud of our own arrogance and pride and selfishness and own ambitions of life. No, if you're going to say you're a Christian, that means you are his and he is the king and you belong to him and you're here not for your own purpose and plans and desires and will, for the will of God. Amen? So Solomon, what I'm telling you is this. Solomon's heartbeat once beat with a singular heartbeat of love towards God. And get this, the God who loved him first. Amen? Amen? Who initiates the relationship that we have with God? Is it us? Were we ever down here just saying, oh, pick me, pick me? No, we were running. We were saying, I don't want you, God. We were holding our fists, spitting in his face, mocking his name, going in our own way, thinking we were big and bad and awesome and great. But it was his mercy that he reached down and he called us. He sent somebody to your house. Somebody made a phone call. Somebody reached out to you. Somebody gave you a track. Somebody, somebody uh, invited you to church. You think that's coincidence? That's no coincidence. There are no coincidences in the kingdom. You guys know this. That is the merciful grace of God to call out your name. 1 John 4, 19. It's the same with Solomon as it is with us. We love because he first loved us. And this was all initiated. Solomon, so even the very fact that he was, he was in this covenant with God was mercy and grace 
from God. His entire relationship with God was mercy and grace. But here is the man who's become lukewarm like the church of Laodicea. And it's time to repent. Amen? Time to repent. Coming back to Solomon here, even as this little child who began his reign with a desperate prayer for the Lord to give him an understanding mind to judge right judgment, God gave him wisdom like no other, riches and fame like no other, none before him nor none after him. There would never be one like Solomon again. There would never be another season like this again. But there were clear conditions in that covenant. And David, David was even warned. Back in 2 Samuel 7, remember when God told David this, uh, speaking to, about David's children, that I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me your throne shall be established forever it's two things about the davidic covenant there it's unconditional amen but the conditional part was there was conditions tied to the 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 kings that were to come and how they were to reign but the covenant that takes us to jesus was completely unconditional amen so this is what we were told back with the davidic covenant god's basically saying your boys are going to mess up. Isn't that what he's saying? And when they mess up, I'm going to discipline them because I'm the father. And I'm going to discipline them and I'm going to set them straight. And guess what? In the end, the kingdom will stand. Why? Because I said so. Not because of how great these kings are. Here's where we get messed up in our Bible. Sometimes this is from maybe how we were taught in Sunday school when we were kids. We look at the characters And we exalt them on a pedestal. And we forget they're not the hero. Right? The hero is Christ. That's why the covenant will stand. Because all these kings will fail. All these kings will flop. And all these kings will show you, we need a better king. What is the whole theme verse of this whole study? What has it been? That a greater than Solomon has come. His name is Jesus. Now, this is what I want to get at. Man, i got to go faster. The warnings of the world intensify as we grow older, don't they? Because with time comes what? Great temptation. It's not going to get easier as you get older. But as you get older, the battle intensifies to stay more faithful. Why? Because with time, whether you realize it or not, comes temptation. Temptation to get proud, temptation to get arrogant, temptation to wonder. Where might the inlet to your heart be today? Are you guarding it with the word of God? And dedicate, are you staying dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ? I would encourage you, write down, I've said this before, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 20. Look at the laws that were in place for the king, what they were supposed to do. They were not only to have the word before them, they were to make their own copy of the word and have it checked with the priest and they were to read it and meditate on it every day so that they would not stray. Same could be true of us. I've said this, I think it was last week. If you take your Bible and you go like this, you wet your finger and you go like this and there's dust on it, it's a pretty good clue. You're going wayward, my friend. Pick up your Bible and read it, amen? So... Look what happens. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh. That's the problem. That's where it started. It started with this daughter of Pharaoh. That was where the inlet to his heart began. Remember me saying that was a big no-no back then? They were not to intermarry with these foreign women. And even back then, it's believed that she was his, uh, Bible scholars point out that this was probably his second wife. So he already had two wives, and this one was Pharaoh, and he's, returning, he's, he's going back to Egypt, which they were never to go back to. They didn't need any handouts from Pharaoh. Amen? They didn't need any peace treaties from Pharaoh. You don't need handouts from the world. You don't need peace treaties with this world. You, are the en- you, you want to be a friend of this world, you become the enemy of God. But he, he reaches to Pharaoh. This is obviously for peace treaty purposes and marries his daughter. 
Then there's the Moabite, the Ammonite. It just continued now. The Edomite, the Sidonian, the Hittite women uh, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them. What are you doing? Neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. God warned them. And it's exactly what he did. And God has warned you, Christian. What will turn your heart away? And we do the same thing, don't we? Oh, no, I'm, about to, I'm some kind of Superman Christian here. I'm not going to be turned away. I'm just going to keep, you know, I am so big in my faith that I can step into that water and it's not going to even affect me because I'm some kind of super mature believer here. Really, I could tell you some stories. I could tell you, I, I've pastored now for uh, almost 12 years here. And I could tell you stories of people who thought they were big. And they thought they were powerful and they thought they were something and they crashed and burned and their entire families fell apart. I could tell you stories of pastors and their ministries. I could tell you stories of what happens to people who think they'll never fall. God knows that it is always possible for his people to be turned away. And let me tell you, this is the principle here. That which turns our heart has our heart. Something or someone is turning you away. And let me tell you, it can be subtle. It's always subtle. It's never a big giant monster that you stare in the face that's easy to see. It's the little things that eat away at you. It's little things like this. I don't really need to go to church this morning. Okay, you watch that. It's little things like this. I don't really need to read my Bible this evening. Little things like that. Oh, this movie, I can kind of separate things. I can watch it, no big deal. This magazine, read this, this website, inlets to your heart, right? Before you know it, you begin to crash and burn. And it's interesting, Solomon clung to these in love, verse 2. He clung to these in love. I, I did some word comparisons here. It's interesting, Gen this is the same idea as Genesis 2.24 of cleaving, holding fast to your spouse. He, he, he's cleaving and he's holding fast, not to one woman, but he's got a thousand. No wonder his affections are, are divided up. And he's, he's cleaving and he's holding it. Now, don't, don't just think of the women. What are they associated with? Idolatry. He's cleaving. He's holding fast to false gods. It's no different than what Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24. Remember when Jesus said this? You cannot serve God and money. One is your master. You can't serve both. It's just like Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple, Jesus said. Christianity is no ego trip. It is a selfless journey of surrender to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, where his, the love that you have for him transcends every other love in your life in such a way that it looks like hatred in comparison because he's your God, not them. Amen? That which turns your heart has your heart. Now let's go further here. What happens as we dig down through verses 3 through 8? Look what happens. The seed was planted long ago, but now the fruit, it's being manifested. That's what's happening. Solomon was chasing that which clearly would never satisfy him. That's true too, isn't it? One wife, another wife, another wife, another wife, another wife. He's not unlike the Samaritan woman. You keep coming to one well after another, lady. You got five husbands at home. Or you've had five husbands and the one you have at home is not your husband, right? Isn't that what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4? Just like that well, you keep coming back to that well and you're unsatisfied, but I've got the living waters that will be all satisfying. That's what Jesus told her. Well, it's no wonder he's got a thousand. You can't be content with one wife, you'll never be content with a thousand wives. I really do see chapter 10 by the way, again, is a foreshadowing of all the writing that's on the wall here. He's, ex he's, he's, he's advancing. He's just taking it further, elevating in his pride, elevating in his luxury, elevating in his eccentrics. 
increasing in all these things. Chapter 10 is the perfect prerequisite now to chapter 11, where now we see, okay, and guess what? Also multiplied the wives and the false gods and the carnality and the way of the world that was inside the man now. I want you to think of this scene. I just wrote down some thoughts. I was thinking, what may have been the chatter in the kingdom at this point? Maybe it was something like this. Who's this visitor that's come to Israel to see the king? Man, she sure does have a parade behind her. And citizens of the kingdom, they begin to discuss, well, it's, it's Queen Sheba. That's who's here, Queen Sheba. Wow, another uh, person says, really? And wh- what God does she serve? Well, she serves many gods. Then another responds, yeah, did you see what she gave him? I mean, wow, uh, that was more gold and more spices than I've ever even heard of. What's he going to do with all that stuff? Someone else says, hey, did you, did you ever see Pharaoh's daughter's house that Solomon built for her? It's quite a home. Someone else chimes in, yeah, well, the ships and their gold are on their way in again today. They're, they've set sail. They're on their way here Uh, We really don't know what he's going to do with all this gold. I mean, have you seen the golden shields, the golden vessels, the golden cups? Who needs all that gold anyways? He just seems to splash it on the walls everywhere we look now. Gold, 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 gold. What's that I, I hear? What's that noise I hear in the distance? Someone says, well, those things are called apes. Apes? What are those? They're not just monkeys. They're like big monkeys. He wanted the big ones. And he's really collecting them. He's got all these apes at his house now. And the king, he just seems to collect them. And then you see this weird, strange-looking bird thing. What is that? Those are called peacocks. What is he doing with peacocks in his backyard? He's collecting them. Why? Don't ask me why, someone might say. I don't know. What are they for? I don't know. But he keeps bringing them in. Then the people, their shouts of, hey, he's married again. Another wife, another wife, another wife, another wife, another wife. And people begin to grumble under their breath. Oh man, who's next to marry Solomon? Is there another wedding today we got to go to? Just one after another. Someone says, hey, did you see the sacrifice today? Did you see the smoke up in the distance in the high place there? That's not for Yahweh. That's not for Yahweh. That's for some other God. Do you know what they worship? Do you know that those people, they, they throw babies into the arms of Molech and they burn to death. That's what's happening in the high places. Our king has become a baby killer. Let that sink in for a minute. How about this Ashtoreth? You know what this goddess is? The goddess of fertility. You know how you worshipped this goddess? Ungodly, immorality, gross sexual licentious behavior that was done in public, in a public display of worship and adoration for this goddess. Believing that now your crops would be blessed and your people would be fruitful. And Molech, if you would take, they had this big... uh, um, a uh, cast iron uh, idol that they had set up and the arms were stretched out and they would take your firstborn baby and they would lay it on the arms of that cast, cast iron, iron, cast iron uh, idol and it would be set over burning coals of fire and they would lay the baby, the newborn uh, infant, on that burning idol and it would burn to death. And they did that Because they believe now, when you did that, the rest of your family would be blessed. That somehow, killing that baby would bless your life. You say, well, this is Old Testament. This is from long ago. No, it's still the United States of America. You kill this baby, and your life will be better. You kill this baby, and you'll be able to go to college. You kill this baby and you'll be able to have the bank account you want. You kill this baby and you'll be able to uh, have a better life and have a better family and do what you want to do. Let me tell you something. It's not about you. Get your head out. You know. <laughs> Moving forward. Verse 4. Solomon is now contrasted to his father David. The very man he should have been like is the very man he is nothing like now. 
Verse 5, the idolatry can clearly be listed and it's labeled one by one. Milcom is just another name for Molech. This is Solomon's syncretism is what this is called. Where you have many gods in your life. Oh, but I favor one. You're an idolater is what you are. You have a shelf of many false gods now and you've arrogantly put Yahweh on the shelf as if he's equal or the other gods are equal to him. Oh, but I put him on the top of the shelf. Let me tell you, Yahweh crushes the shelf. There's no room for idolatry if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. Amen? Verses 6 through 7, Solomon was now a man uh, known as one who practices evil. You're not just, this isn't just an idea of he stumbled, he fell, he made a mistake. No, you practice it, my friend. It has become your life. And notice who Solomon, uh, who Solomon uh, does all this for. Verse 8. Verse 8, it says, um, and, and so he did for all his foreign wives. I'll do this for you, baby. <laughs> do this for you, babe. It's no big deal. You know, we all would do well to take a lesson from Job. You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Rebuke her. So he did for all his foreign wives. You see, you do what you want to do for the God of your choice. You come to church because you want to. You serve at a back-to-school bash because you want to. You pray for someone because you want to. You share the gospel because you want to. You read your Bible because you want to. And if you don't, don't make excuses. It's because you don't want to. Because there's something else you would rather do. It's heavy, isn't it? It's a heavy wake-up call chapter. By the way, let me point this out. Do you see the mountain east of Jerusalem here uh, that, that's referred to. It says in verse 7, this took place on the mountain east of Jerusalem. Guess what that mountain is? Mount of Olives. A very sacred mountain that Jesus would come down. A very sacred mountain that one day will be split into at his arrival. The true king is the mountain where King Solomon has this idolatry taking place. Now let me really blow your minds here. It's also believed that that exact spot of a certain hill on the south uh, side of this two-mile ridge that was the Mount of Olives, in this mount, there's, there's a hill. It's called the Hill of Evil Counsel. It's called the Hill of Evil Counsel because many believe it to be the exact location where Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Atop that mountain was the house of Caiaphas. This was also south, about south-southeast of the Valley of Hinnom. You know what that was? That was the valley Jesus described as hell. Hell's like that place where the garbage dump burns. Well, just south of that is Caiaphas' house where Solomon, where uh, Judas betrayed Jesus and where this idolatry is believed to have taken place. Get this, it also happens to be a place where the United Nations have one of their buildings set up. Chew on that for a minute. You ever read their policies? What they want to do? You ever, think, you ever read and see how they view children? You know, what, they, what their intentions are for this world? What they think of the nation of Israel? Well, that's homework. You could check that out. Let me go faster. Let me just say in passing, sin is never enough, and you must master it or it will master you. Amen? It will never be enough. As one once wisely said, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. Regardless of his 40 years as king, longevity does not equal lasting legacy. Right? And now... He's going to just be at leave behind a mess. That will be Solomon's story. Solomon begins to feel the weight of the sin. I'll go through this, the remainder of the chapter, quickly. Verses 9 through 40. The Lord's obviously angry with Solomon. Verses 9 through 10, right? 
There's two distinct times God had already shown up to Solomon and warned him, don't go after idolatry. Don't do it, Solomon. That's the mercy of God. To some of us, there's warning. You've seen it. If you just maybe pause for a minute, maybe there's something in your life like that. You know it's like God has shown up again and again and said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. I'm warning you, don't do this. And what do we do? We do it. The Lord confronts Solomon, verses 11 through 13. Notice God notes Solomon. He practices the evil in verse 11 again, practices his practice in verse 11. Sin is to miss the mark. Iniquity means premeditated sin, and transgression is to cross the line. That's the way Solomon went. He's not just missing the mark here. He's not just premeditated on his sin and thinking about doing it. He's following through and he's crossing a line. Some of you, I wonder, have you crossed the line? Has it become your practice now? And just because we hide it well does not mean we get away with it. There's an all-seeing eye of God here who's going to hold you accountable to your actions. God is willing to be merciful. Notice verses 12 to 3, but not for Solomon, for David. For David's sake, I'll be merciful. I'll let you live out the rest of your reign, but understand this, the kingdom will be torn from your son. The Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, verses 14 through 22. Notice there's actually three of them, isn't there? Three adversaries now. Do you remember what that word adversary means? It literally means this, translation, Satan. And I like, what, I like this one note from one old uh, Bible teacher. He said this, uh, when he sent to Hiram to assist him, Uh, In the building of the temple of the Lord, meaning Solomon, when Solomon sent to Hiram to assist him in the building of the temple of the Lord, he could say back then there was no Satan. Remember we saw that? There was no adversary in Saul's life. Verse Kings 5, 4. But now, this Bible teacher says this, he had turned away from God and three Satans rise up against him at once. Hadad, Rizon, and Jeroboam. He not just has one but many. Let me tell you, when problems are happening, when storms are hitting you, it's a wake-up time. Amen? I'm not saying that every time you have a storm is because you've done something wrong. You guys know better than that. Sometimes God's just taking, he's just growing you. He's refining, refining you. But many times, there are storms that are meant to shake us up and wake us up to turn around and repent. Many times, there are storms that hit us like Jonah. We're out on a ship setting sail in a direction we shouldn't be going in. And he still controls the fish, right? He still controls the ocean. And he still sees everywhere you roam, he can find you. He knows you and he'll call you back. And he can send the adversaries into your life. You know, more trouble comes. He was an adversary, verse 25, of Israel all the days of Solomon, doing harm as Hadad did, and he loathed Israel and reigned over Syria, verse 25. We don't know exactly what he did, but we know that he caused trouble. Solomon's false sense of peace is collapsing. Do you see that? Many assume that one of the reasons he had a thousand thousand women in his life and the uh, 700 wives here is that he not only, it started here, and many point out that it's important that he points out what happened with the daughter of Pharaoh first because it was for a peace treaty. So some assume that what took place is Solomon's marrying all these wives in peace treaties with nations because if you marry the wife, the nation will not, is not going to go to war with you if you marry the daughter of the king. And if that's the case, let me just tell you, that's a false sense of peace Solomon was taking into his own hands. Some of us, we try to just do what we think. We try to figure things out on our own. And we try to create for ourselves a false sense of reality, a false sense of peace. I got it under control. Just marry another wife. Peace treaty, peace treaty, peace treaty, peace treaty. Where's the peace now? It comes crashing down. Why? Because you should have trusted God. Some trust in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord our God, Solomon. Amen? Amen. So then Jeroboam, that we'll, well, then we see verses 23 through 24, uh, God raised up another adversary to Solomon. Uh, so there's uh, the first one, then there's the second one, then there's Jeroboam, a servant of Solomon. 
is promised 10 tribes torn from Solomon and given to him once Solomon dies, verses 26 to 39. And then Solomon's actual final testimony, as we get to the end of his life in verse 40, his final testimony, do you notice this, at the end of his life was really that he's fighting the hand of God. That's how his story ends. And I was really chewing on this. I, we all like to think, do you ever think, how does Solomon really end? Kind of like Jonah. How does Jonah, where does he go from here? It's kind of a mystery how, as the book of Jonah ends and he's just there moping and pouting in his sin. What's really what's happening with Solomon at the end of his life, that's all we know, is he's fighting the hand of God. Some of you are fighting the hand of God in your own life. You're wrestling with the Lord. What's the evidence of this? Well, it says this. Um, it, it says in verse 40, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. What, he's what is he trying to do? Take out, would take out the will of God. You can't take out the will of God. Amen? You can't do it. So he's chasing Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt. He's running to Egypt and he's getting safety there. And he can't, he can't catch his adversary. He can't catch his foe who God has given the kingdom to. Who's this sound like? This is a story we've heard before. You remember Saul? Remember Saul? I mean, let, let me read it to you. This is what the prophet Samuel said to Saul who was king. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul, this is King Saul before David, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and given it to a neighbor of yours who is better from you. Same language, torn from you, ripped from you. You can't stop this. And it's given to another. Well, here is Solomon and what happens? Ten tribes torn from him. And they're going to be given to another. You can't stop this. And you know what the Bible says about Saul? Remember, Saul goes after David. That was his adversary. That was, that was the one God was giving the kingdom to. And Saul sought him, the Bible says, every day. But God did not give him into his hand. 1 Samuel 23, 14, the Robin Hood years of David. There's Saul chasing David in the wilderness and he just can't catch him. Well, guess what? Ironically, David's son Solomon really becomes a little Saul. Chasing Jeroboam, but unable to grab him. Why? Because you can't fight the will of God. You live with your consequences. You eat the gravel you've shoveled into your mouth, and you repent, and you own your mistakes like you need to. Amen? And you realize that what I did was wrong, and you repent and turn. But this is what sin does, and I'll leave you with this. Sin will twist you, sin will bend you, sin will break you, sin will redirect you in such a way as to make you look more like the enemy of God than the friend of God. It is a scary reality. And as you see Solomon, he, and he goes the way of all men, what happens in verses 41 through 43? He dies. Like any other man, he dies, he's buried, he's put in a tomb, nothing special, nothing grand. He's a human being who is flawed, who is frail, who has died. And that is why I leave you with this again, perfect place to leave you with this. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Amen? Jesus is the king of kings whose wisdom goes on. He is the king of kings who never fails or drops the ball in the work that is at hand. He is the king of kings who continues to glorify the Father in perfection. He is the king of kings who defies the grave and the tomb does not hold him down. He is the king of kings whose kingdom never ends and never fails. For he establishes his judgment and his righteousness forevermore in his kingdom that will have no end. He is the king of kings who has nothing torn from him but has everything given to him for all honor and all glory and all worship are, are due to him as he ascends to the throne in heaven. Jesus is the king. He is the greater king than Solomon and he is the king you need to look to and he is the king you need to learn from lest you go the way of Solomon to the grave with great regret. Amen? Let's stand, bow our heads and close our eyes. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I think of a text where Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount 
had something to say about Solomon. He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You look at the flowers of the field. And Jesus points out that these flowers are more beautiful in their glory than Solomon was ever arrayed in. And these flowers, they don't last. They're gathered up and they're thrown into the fire. How much more is he going to care for you? The God who created the flowers is the God who will care for you and take care of you. And sometimes in all our comforts of life and all our luxuries, we can become so complacent that we take our eyes off of the one who gave it all to us. And we need to look back to the flowers and remember, therefore do not be anxious, Jesus says. What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. That's the way the world thinks. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What happened to Solomon? Solomon, at the end of his life, proved to seek his own kingdom, but not God's kingdom first. And in all reality, brothers and sisters, there is no other kingdom. All the kingdoms that we attempt to build for ourselves and our lives is a false sense of peace, is a false sense of accomplishment. They will crumble and they will fall. We need to be about our Father's work. We need to be about Jesus' kingdom building program for there is no other eternal forever kingdom than his. So as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want you to respond to the Lord in the best way that you know how. I want you to be honest with yourself. Take a good long look in the mirror and ask yourself, are there warning signs of a drifting heart, of a divided heart in me. And if there is, then repent. Let the Lord deal with you. If you are here and you don't know Jesus, I would encourage you, please come forward. Come grab me, grab someone. We'd love to tell you how you can know Christ as your Savior. Maybe you hear all this today and you say, for the first time, I see that I am all about myself. I am not a Christian. I don't even know what it means to be a Christian but I see that I need Jesus. I see that I, I need this Jesus. And turn from your sin and embrace this Jesus who died on a cross for you and conquered sin, Satan, death, and hell for you so you would not have to go to hell. You could spend eternity with him in his heaven forever and even in the new heavens and the new earth. But you must turn from sin, turn to Jesus, receive him and embrace him as your Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Talk to the Lord before we sing. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed and you're talking to the Lord. I wonder if you see something in your life that just has to change. You know 
what is becoming, what is coming between you and Jesus. You know what is holding you back from surrender to Jesus. You know what has stolen your passion, your drive, and your faithfulness to Jesus. I'm pleading with you to deal with it. Deal with it before you leave. Because if it sits there and it remains there, in time it will consume you. So lay it down. Lay it down at his altar. Say, Jesus, I'm giving this to you. If you're lost, listen, regardless of what you've done, there is no sin too deep, too wide, too great, too massive that Jesus will not forgive. He will forgive you. That's why he died on the cross for you. He bled and died for you, laid down his life in your place and paid your sin debt because he loves you and he'll save you. You give him your sin in exchange for him as your savior right now. The best way you know how you call out to him and say, Jesus, I know I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come in to my life and my heart. Set up shop on the throne of my heart and be my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Save me. Call out to him the best way you know how and ask him to save you. Surrender your life to him. Repent and turn to him. He'll save you right now. No sinner is too far from his mercy and his grace. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that indeed for God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Lord, even as believers, if we go wayward, if we stumble and we fall and we Go the way of Solomon, Lord. There's still mercy and grace. If there's breath in our lungs, Lord, we can turn right now and come home. I pray that we would. We look unto you. We praise you, Jesus. In your holy name, we trust our King. We rest and we pray and we wait. Amen. Sing.